Um, okay, so, uh, so again, um, uh, this is another segment in the thing. I'm Andy Warfield, one of the um, co-founders of Coho. And now I'm going to talk about how we use SDN uh, inside the product uh, to, to really make the storage scale out. Okay, so <coughs> how many of you guys know anything about SDN? I can spell it. <laughs> <laughs> Tom knows a little bit about SDN, I think. Um, so there's, this is a... Uh, this is a really tricky thing to talk about at the at the right level without being either uh, too deep or completely patronizing on stuff. So tell me if I'm going in either of those directions. Um, there is a network operations problem that has motivated these switches, right? It, it, it is to do with things like uh, vendor CLIs onto uh, onto switches, and especially things like uh, like VLAN uh, provisioning, right? That you know, you now suddenly have this enormous density of VMs in your network. Uh, your VMs are often sharing physical links. You want to <coughs> isolate those, but VLANs as a tool, right, are limited in number, um, but also are a real pain to set up across a network. And so in a large scale enterprise network, um, for instance, with, with UBC, um, you, uh, you see a situation where there's a spreadsheet that somebody has, right, it's often printed out and taped to a wall, right, and, and it's got the VLAN assignments. Right, and you know when you want a new one, somebody goes over to the spreadsheet and you know <laughs> they, you know they write in the the, the, the allocation that they want, and then there's place to manage my networks <laughs> <laughs> by Excel, literally, yeah. Um, and so the one of the really initial motivations for SDN was just that problem, right? How do I more flexibly solve the provisioning problem in my network? The observation that the SDN guys made is that these switches are incredibly capable and we are not exposing most of that capability, right? So these switches um, inside them um, have a bunch of really, really efficient stuff, right? So typical switch architectures, you have a slow path, right? Often this is something like an x86, right? And this is where all of your you know, routing protocols and stuff run, right? You never want your data, right, that's being forwarded to go to that level, right, unless it's an exceptional event. Right? And then you have this fast data path, right? And the data path has a bunch of very expensive memory, right? That is, you know, taking packets off of one port, figuring out where to send it, and sending it down to another port, right? The three notable bits of memory in here are a L2 forwarding table, right? This is Ethernet max. A L3 forwarding table, right? This will be IPv4 or IPv6 addresses, right? And a TCAM, right? And a TCAM is a really, really expensive piece of memory. It's smaller than both of these, and it lets you do kind of arbitrary matching on packet headers, right? So these things are, are usually, you know, tree implementations that know these fields in the packet, whereas this thing will let you say, in the first, you know, 100 odd bytes of the packet, tell me if this is set to this field and this is set to this field, right? And then do this. So this is how you implement things like ACLs, right? On a, on a switch. And so the way that these have been exposed for a really long time is that the things that run up here, right, interact with them, right? So you have BGP or you have spanning tree or whatever, right? and that's the only way to program these things, right? You do ARP sniffing and uh, address sniffing and stuff to program the, uh, the L2 and so on. Um, I guess the, the biggest observation from the OpenFlow guys was that in an enterprise, you actually own all the switching, right? Even if it comes from different vendors, you own it all, and you can make global decisions. And so why are you doing this thing where you let these guys figure it out for themselves, right? Running these like quite complicated converging protocols. Instead, I'm just going to put this big, right, brain, right? often called a controller, right up here. And this is going to talk right down onto these, and it's going to program all your switches to set up paths and stuff. And so you can tell the network to set up you know, things like tunnels across all of the devices. Right? Now, there's, there's a huge segue that we could go on to around some of the, uh, the other approaches to SDN with things like NSX, where it's largely endpoint driven um, using tunnels. Um, it's a different way of approaching this. It's not super um, useful in the context of understanding what, what we're doing, right? We are not um, requiring that the customer network be an SDN network, right? It's great if that's the way things go, right? If SDN is really successful, we will be able to take advantage of a lot of broader network stuff. But Coho's observation on this is 
the APIs, and currently it's OpenFlow here, um, that these things are using to program these switches, we can use to program the switches for a storage system, right? And so this convergence that we have, that switch to me is an embedded system, right? And one way to think about this system is this is, you know, one giant scalable array, and these are your ports on the back of it. These are your client ports. You just plug one server into each of these things, right? And, and off you go, right? Or, or dual if you want redundancy. Um, so now let me answer the question about how we make NFS work on this. One quick question, Andy, yeah. before we get into it. We talk about these switches, and we generically talk about that. Do you actually talk about what the core of these switches are and, and who they are? Like, what's, whose switch is it? Oh, we're using an Arista. Yeah. It's okay. a 7050. <laughs> yeah, 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 I'm but fine with we that. We want to give the Arista the, uh, some love. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And no, 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 and, and Arista is, so Arista implemented OpenFlow early. They have a great platform. Um, it's been a delightful switch to work on, right? They, they really did a lot of stuff in terms of supporting development on the switch two years ago that, that we're only seeing from other vendors switch. Now, right now, uh, Arista is finally facing competition on this class of switching. And so um, there are a bunch of really, really interesting 10 gig switches coming out. Now um, the Arista switch itself, is it raw as if you bought that Arista switch directly from Arista? The OpenFlow delivery is, you, you can just pull in continuous integration. We, we use Arista's OpenFlow implementation, uh, but we run code on the switch, right? So Arista lets you host VMs on the switch, right? right. They let you run stuff in the, in the Linux that runs on the switch. We do both of those things. So yeah. we are locked in at some level to how much we can modify it on the OpenFlow side? Or can you, uh, how, like obviously there's changes in firmware changes and changes in the software layers at OpenFlow that are coming that you can continuously aggressively apply to your switches. Can we do that to this Arista switch as we could in other Arista switches? <coughs> yes, the, uh, the. Without uh, risking affecting the coho environment. That's, so we're, we're not doing anything horrendously abusive on the, on the Arista, right? We're using their environment, right? They, they allow, there are other examples of Arista partners that use VMs running on the switch. Right. right? So, so yeah, the switch is upgradable. Um, so, am I okay, Forbes? Yeah, no, that's good. Yeah. All right. We're good. <laughs> um, so one way we use the switch is, uh, is the NFS end of things. And so what you can think of here is in that case, right, you have these four boxes, right, sitting at the back. So there's four 10 gig ports, right? Now, you can only do so much in terms of TCP, right? TCP is, uh, is a bit of a grim protocol in terms of, uh, in terms of like many things, multipath and uh, aggregating in, in networking. Um, but the thing that we can do is, is pretty neat here. So you have an ESX box. You plug a 10 gig port into here, right? Plug it into the switch. Each of these guys map out like this. The way you can think about this is I have one IP address, right? I think I, I've lost my display. My NFS server is 1.1.1.1. I'm doing the thing that you're taught never to do in IP networking, right? All of these hosts have the IP address 1.1.1.1, right? They, they all are configured with the same IP, right? They can't talk to each other on that IP, right? There is no conventional IP link between these things. Instead, what happens is when ESX opens up NFS related traffic to here, right? It tries to open an NFS connection to the data store at 1.1.1.1. OpenFlow is set up to trigger a fault on that network, right? We, we trap into our controller, right? This is where we take that slow data path that you don't want to take in the common case. And it goes, oh, hey, there's a new NFS connection, right? I'm going to choose one of these boxes to steer that to, right? And so it sticks a rule down into those forwarding tables and says, this ESX instance's NFS connection should currently be mapped onto this host. Okay. When the next ESX host <coughs> comes up, the same thing happens, right? Comes in here, throws a fault, it gets mapped onto something else, right? And so what you get as a consequence of this is I can run all of these connections actively, right? I can't do, this is the like sort of limit of what you can achieve with, with this application of SDN. I cannot give you you know, um, uh, division within this TCP connection, right? Because the, the, the router is only capable, the switch is only capable of dealing with the very front of the packet, 
and your TCP headers end up in the middle of the packet. Right? So you're kind of limited with how much you can decompose that. This is changing. Right? The switches are becoming like, considerably more powerful year on year. Um, but right now, this is the, the best you can do. And so basically, what we've done is we've hoisted the IP stack off of these things into the switch. And now we can move these flows around as we need to. Right? So you map this in with no changes to NFS. I'm getting like a PNFS style property. Right? And over the lifetime of these, I can move these things around. Right? I can move them around from from node to node. And the way that that works is if I decide that actually you know, your data is somewhere else, or if I have you know, 10 ESX hosts and I happen to have placed my two busiest connections onto here, right, the way that that works is we continuously monitor load through the switch. Right? We watch how much traffic is flowing through to each of these ports. And we make a decision that you know, we're, we're overusing one of these ports and we need to move a connection. And so the, the load balancer inside the NFS implementation goes, OK, please flush all traffic on this connection. Right? It finishes the outstanding requests. It comes back. And then it moves the session to another node. So is that, that move is by a change of the, the destination to the, MAC? To the open flow um, rules. No, no, no. Just, to the, just, just says this flow now goes to this port instead of that port. Yeah. Right? Um, yeah. So Same. Can, you, can you aggregate these ports together to get more bandwidth? Um, like, can you only get 10 gig between an ESX host and the storage array then? Or can you get right now, gig? well, so the way that we can get 20 gig right now is if you run two data stores. Right, so, so if you run a second data store off here on another NIC, right, but to a single VMDK, mm -hmm. right, over NFS, there is, there is nothing right now that, uh, that and it needs client-side change to do better bonding than you can right now. There's just no active-active like flow granularity bonding across that second data rules. store need to be on a, a new IP address in order for the for yes the, yeah. yes yeah that's right um. it's, it's not a problem though because the, the data store is defined across all of the ESX servers as being on this other IP address that's right that's right so it's the cluster sees two IP addresses and two yeah. data stores yeah right. Um, so this is, this is one way we use the SDN, right? We use the SDN in a bunch of other ways. I, I won't go into all of them because then I'll really cut Forbes off. Um, but you know, we can use it to fence these nodes, um, right? Which, which removes a lot of the pain in building a distributed storage system, right? We can actually tell the switch to cut off a node that has stopped communicating, right? Or, so failure re recovery and failure handling uh, is helped by the SDN interaction. Also, the uh, effectively backplane that these things use to talk to each other is an isolated network on the SDN, right? And we can take advantage of all of these same forwarding tables to do really cool stuff in how these nodes talk to each other, right? And how data scales out on them. And that's a space where, you know, as you watch us over the next couple of years, you'll see us do some really, really interesting things in terms of moving the storage protocols closer to the switch. Um, cool. Okay. Is, uh, I think that's probably you know, the extent of what I really wanted to explain in terms of, uh, in terms of the SDN. There's, there's loads of really interesting stuff here, and you know, there's, there's lots of gore that we can go into, but I want to let Forbes talk, and I want to answer any questions if you have them. Just a short, uh, uh, yeah. maybe silly question. Uh, we've seen that uh, hardware and also the switch part uh, is uh, available in the uh, user interface. Uh, do you manage also the uh, firmware upgrade of the switches? Yes. Yes. Okay. So it's uh, fully integrated. Yes. Uh, yes. Exactly. And uh, how do you provide the uh, redundant connection? Right. So the redundancy work, um, the way that that goes is a uh, second switch yeah. here. And you butterfly your cabling. Okay. Right. So but across the switch. Exactly. So one physical node here huh? will have a wire into each switch. Okay. You plumb the clients through both switches. Um, and then you can run everything active, right? If you lose a switch, you lose half of your bandwidth, but no connectivity, right? Um, Across the switches, you are it's using It's just uh, ports, two, two ports okay. bridged, yeah, yeah. That's not a high traffic path. The, right, the connection, yeah. the, the link aggregation is done by, by you, you using that's SDN? That's right, that's right, okay. yeah. A question from Twitter from Rob Novak was, uh, how many virtual IPs can we have on the, uh, on the array to present out these NFS shares through? So this is, this, this is a question that we get from, uh, from VM, uh, VMware admins all the time. So in the GA, um, in the UI, you get one, right? You get one data store, right? You, you can go to the CLI, um, and we can, you know, we can lead you through um, doing more than one. But I encourage you 
uh, to question your heritage as a VMware administrator around why you have more than one data stores. Because it's usually around queuing and, and NFS doesn't care about it. Exactly, right? It's, 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 it's a throwback to LUNs, right? Everything that you have in that data store is wrapping up a bunch of crappy properties that LUNs exposed, right? And, you know, we don't have LUNs. And so there's an awful lot that we can do, right, with a single data store, right? We can have different priorities for service, right? We can, we can scale our capacity effectively infinitely, right? There's loads and loads of stuff there. Now, there's, there's clear reasons, right, like the one that I mentioned around taking advantage of two ports actively where you want it. Um, and, you know, as we move into doing a full physical NFS implementation later in the year, right, we will want different exposed mount points on the thing. Um, but, you know, you can get very, very far with a single data store, and it's a much nicer management experience. Yeah, the only uh, issue is that uh, on S SXI, you need uh, two 10 gig uh, links uh, just for redundancy. Right. So actually, you can use only one active and the second uh, is... Uh, that's right, it's active passive, but that's, that's the sort of standard for, for IP networks, right, for storage. Exactly. Um, so, so the, the second data store thing is really just a fantastic optimization on top of that, right? The, the normal case is you're only using one. Um, yeah. I mean, do you see NFS4 ever making a kind of a proper <laughs> introduction into the world or the world of VMware <laughs> and to be able to actively use both links as a you know, PNFS? I, 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 yeah, yeah, I would love to, I would love to see it. Um, the, do you uh, support it or do you, is there any, better, any kind of so NFS v4 plus PNFS uh, is, a, is a, I mean, the NFS v4 is a much bigger spec to build than v3. It's a complicated protocol. Um, uh, but, you know, we will happily go there if there's the, the clients for it. Um, we're getting, a, like I said, we're getting a lot of the PNFS value on this. Um, but there's a lot of stuff that's pretty nice about, about PNFS that I would love to add. So, yeah. And you do provide data encryption at rest, right? Pardon? Uh, we don't, we have, uh, we have data protection at rest, but not encryption right now. Okay. Um, but uh, it's just, uh, you know, it's just like, a, we can only do so much, right? So, uh, roadmap. It's, it's a roadmap thing, yeah. Yeah, and there's 40 gig E also sitting on roadmap? <coughs> yes, uh, on roadmap. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's, so it, it's super interesting to watch the trending between the flash performance and the oh. Ethernet performance, right? They're pretty, like this balanced thing that I'm talking about is, it, it seems to be going the right direction, right, on these things. Flash is gonna kind of step up year on year and 40 gig switching is going to pop out at about the right time. So is if you add a second switch, uh, is OpenFlow smart enough to say don't bridge between switches to get down to the data store? Will it find the most direct path or will it use an extra hop? Between our two switches or the between, your two switches. between our two switches, we have complete control, right? So we'll we'll do the right thing. Okay. Um, w one of the interesting challenges that we have is in a complicated customer network. If there's a few hops of switching ahead of us, right, you have to do some work to plumb that 40 gig, right? If you really want to plumb 40 gig through a pair of external vendor switches, right, there's a bunch of network design that needs to happen. It's far preferable to get the servers close to the to the switch if you want to expose that much. Performance and this is I mean it's a weird problem you know IP storage hasn't historically had this much uh, aperture right in terms of access to storage so you know you have to do the work to plumb it through right it was just my it's my thought that if you're if OpenFlow is moving where the connections between the ESX hosts are and which storage array it's getting to and which port on the storage array it's going right. to if you've got two switches now that storage array is on two different switches and OpenFlow could be moving it back and forth between which switches. Or well, making so, the connection between the ESX host and so, the storage array. So so remember array. the uh, yeah so the um, with two switches you have two physical links right but the ESX host is only going to use one of them right, right for the IP address right right it's just IP um, you know forwarding on the client side and so the data comes in there that switch has one path to each of these physical boxes and right. that's what it'll use okay. Right. The same so switch where you have the active exactly. link. Exactly. Right, and it's just my concern that if <coughs> the if the packet comes into the switch, the switch doesn't say go to the other switch and then down to the storage array. We it only says do go that. directly to the yes. storage array we I'm already attached to. Exactly. We only do that in the case of failure. Right. So. Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a, uh, a lot of stuff that you guys have done around different topologies? Because obviously, you know, there's a bare assumption what we've talked about that your hosts are sitting right beside it plug directly into it. Yep. Obviously, there's a lot of other exciting topologies with STP spinning all over the place, <laughs> uh, you know, 
link aggregation for the four by ten uplink into our core, you know, or whether you've got stuff sitting in an access layer and goes back to the core. So, what do you guys have as far as providing direction on, you know, for customers to go in and? Yeah, we're so this has been uh, interesting, but right, we've been building out a lot of uh, customer documentation around different switches that we see in the field, and in fact, a lot of the a lot of the customer engagement that we see is actually around the network planning side of things. We do a lot of that before we put hardware in. Right, so we, we go through an enormous amount of stuff there. There's potential issues, you know, other than just poor workloads is, you know, the topology in the network I see is one of the biggest issues where a client side could have because of, you know, internal complexity. Yeah. Yes. But do, do we see, do we see this, this treated as a storage fabric completely <coughs> separate from the, the client connectivity fabric that your ASX servers are also attached to? Or do we see a converged fabric as, as being a good so design? Right now, um, my view is that this is uh, uh, an independent fabric. Right? So this now, is the storage this network. This is the storage network. Not right? the connectivity network. That's right. Yeah. Um, we, can, you know, we can go in that direction, um, but doesn't really seem to be the right thing to do right now. Um, Second question, uh, again, channeling Rob Novak, uh, does it make sense to use this as storage for anything other than VMs? You know, if, if I buy a tin tree array, they say don't, don't use this as a general purpose oh. NFS server because we are yeah. tuned to be really good for VMs. Yeah, so, uh, Alsha, you're, the, well, well, I guess Rob Novak is asking a great question. So, <laughs> we're, we're a startup, right? And so, you know, we have to be ruthless about what we build, right? We, we have to be very careful about scoping stuff. One of the reasons that we chose VMware first was that we could build less than general purpose NFS, right? So this is the, the more negative way of saying what you just said, um, right? That in this case, performance and latency are very important, but the total number of files is generally not in the millions, and the amount of metadata load that you place on the thing is not particularly high. And so that was the thing that we built first. And that is the sort of like hypervisor, data hypervisor level of things, right? What we are doing right now is adding a layer on top of that that does small object support and metadata support, right? That layer is the sort of application above the VM, right? It uses the same coarse-grained objects as a location to store things like its own metadata and small objects and so on. Um, and it, you know, scales out basically on top of that. So the next major release from us will be full physical NFS um, in addition to VMware workloads. And that's something that with the customers that we've seen being, you know, kind of more sophisticated environments, they don't want just VMware storage, right? They really, really want something that's going to store their home directories and so on as well. And so that's, that's squarely where we're headed. 